I Am Legend was one of the top grossing films of 2007, but few people know that the theatrical end wasn't the real one. From changes in the original source material to two different endings, here's how it was supposed to unravel. Now, you know it ain't a good film if the hero doesn't save the day in the end. Well, that's the memo director Francis Lawrence got for it. The alternate ending that many people saw on the movie's DVD was actually the original one, but it didn't do well with the test audience. In conversation with Screen Rant, the director revealed they'd tested the movie twice and both times the audience simply didn't like it. Poor test screening reactions had them pivot to another, more Hollywood-worthy ending. The crew then did some 11th hour reshoots to give us the conventionally legendary ending that we all grew to love. In the theatrical version, Neville sacrifices himself after realizing his last experiment worked. After giving Anna and Ethan a vial of his test subject's blood, he tells them to leave and stays behind to blow up the Dark Seekers trying to kill them. He dies in a blaze of glory with an ending that the audience would appreciate. Cut to the scene where Anna arrives at the survivor's colony in Vermont and gives the vial to a guard, calling it Dr. Robert Neville's legend. So we all loved the theatrical ending, because of course we want the hero to save the day. But what if the hero was in the wrong here? What if his pursuit of three years was a selfish and blind attempt? But more on that later. Well, according to the original release, that's what actually happened. So the theatrical and original cut of I Am Legend is exactly the same until the last five minutes. The doctor believes that it was Anna's belief in God that led her to him. We've got to consider that despite being a man of science, this man believes in signs. In both versions, the climax of the movie happens when he first notices a butterfly in his lab. The butterfly reminds him of his daughter, asking him to look at a butterfly shortly before she dies. It's the interpretation of the butterfly in his lab when both endings diverge. In the theatrical release, he notices a butterfly pattern on the cracked glass when they attack. When he turns to look at Anna, he sees a butterfly tattooed on her neck as she cradles Ethan. He takes the butterfly as a sign and listens to his intuition, calling him to protect the mother and son. However, in the alternate ending, things went in quite the opposite direction. So let's back it up for a bit. Throughout the movie, we see the Dark Seeker's bloodlust. We also see Dr. Neville conducting tons of experiments on them and, of course, killing them left and right. He thinks these creatures are void of any social structure or humanity. Rabid beasts are one way to put it. So, in his eyes, unless the Dark Seekers cannot be cured, they must be killed. He's created a wall between himself and the affected, making him see them as only lab rats and not sick humans. Talk about being dehumanizing. Getting back on track, the alpha male draws a butterfly on the glass door, separating Neville from the Dark Seekers. He realizes that the Dark Seeker is trying to communicate, and it completely flips his mind. As it should, honestly. The knowledge devastates our evil hero. He then sees a butterfly tattoo on the Dark Seeker in his lab and realizes that the infected have only become violent after he kidnaps the Alpha's mate. The realization that they in fact do have a social structure and familial bond dawns on him. So our hero may have turned out to be evil, but he isn't stupid. After finally realizing his mistake, he understands he needs a new approach. Dr. Neville then treats the Dark Seekers like sentient beings. Once he realizes they can think and feel like him, he puts his firearm down and takes the alpha female out to her partner. Though all the Dark Seekers seem angry and violent, a huge growl from the alpha silences them, showing that the rest follow his command. Neville also bumps into the alpha, who then roars into his ear to show anger. What's interesting in this scene is the level of control and the hierarchical structure the Dark Seekers follow. In contrast to what the audience previously sees, the lower ranked Dark Seekers do not so much as touch Neville despite being agitated. This could go wrong too, and one of them may show zero impulse control attacking the doctor, but none of them does. They give him room to push the gurney out and even allow him to give the alpha female a shot to bring her to consciousness. The alpha picks up his mate rather softly, and the tender way she nuzzles him illustrates that. 
The Dark Seekers not only have a social order, but feelings too. So, our man Neville's been conducting unethical experiments all this time. The Dark Seekers feel anger, pain, and love all the same as they did when they were humans. Visibly distraught, Neville apologizes to the infected humans. And thankfully, we can see he actually means it. He also realizes the legend he's become. The alternate ending, by the way, is also different to what the source material had, but conveys the thought-provoking element about discrimination and bigotry. The alternate ending shows the Dark Seekers allowing Neville, Anna, and Ethan to leave his destroyed lab. The camera cuts to a shot of all the test subjects he's had over the years, a mural of his victims. The understanding of the gravity of his atrocities dawns on his face. As a scientist and a former soldier, he finally realizes how grave his violations against the infected were. The theatrical is a complete juxtaposition to this realization. Neville dies thinking he's a hero who's cured the Krippen virus, saving the world from the monsters. Many argue that the theatrical release was a gross misinterpretation of Matheson's novella. The audience doesn't see the extent of Neville's actions and how he dehumanized and discriminated against the others to cover his mistreatment of the Dark Seekers. Finally, the three humans survive and leave Manhattan in search of a survivor's colony in Vermont. The alternate ending is rather peaceful and more open-ended. Neville doesn't go out in glory but realizes his mistake, and he, Anna, and Ethan leave the city with no cure in hand. His research is abandoned, and he will live with the knowledge of his mistreatment of the Dark Seekers in his desperate search for a cure. When his family dies, he puts all of his belief into finding a cure, thinking that's the only way for humanity to survive. In his expedition for one, he simply cannot see the Dark Seekers clearly. The fact that Anna and Ethan arrive, proving his theory about him being the last living man isn't a source of relief. But he actually seems annoyed. In the ending scene, we see Anna trying to communicate with a new radio transmission as the three drive to Bethel, Vermont. Instead of her last words being, this is his legend, they are, you are not alone. Though this ending doesn't mean a happy one for the character, it's more reflective of life in reality. The future is uncertain, and the three try their odds against the unknown. Perhaps this was the part that didn't quite sit right with the test audience. It wasn't flashy or very film-like, but more ambiguous and dependent on the audience's interpretation. And there you have it, the alternate ending of I Am Legend Explained.